conversations that we were having before tonight started. Um, what I really kind of thought was probably a good, a good place to start, both with some panelists and with you guys, is just looking at what are the barriers and what are the obstacles right now uh, for people you know, having, having safer sex to be a part of their lives. Is it, you know, is it fear and shame about talking about the issue or raising it with a sexual partner? Is, is, uh, is it a financial issue in terms of or, or access issue, something that's more structural? Um, or is it, you know, there's a common conception, particularly I think about gay men my age and older, that younger gay men and bisexual men just don't get it because it's not, you know, it's not the same as it was in the 80s and 90s, so they're not as concerned about it. You know, I, I want to actually start back at the end of the end because I think you have a perspective with youth. Um, so I'd like to start with you on that and move around a little bit. Yeah, Sean. Um, with all that you said, like, for, from my experience, evaluating and monitoring young people that are on Facebook, um, I find that practicing safe sex and why that matters is multiple, um, and it is also very complex. Um, you talked about the nuances of access and information, and I think um, one thing that our young people deal with um, in the community is the, is the basis that they are not seeing the devastation um, that comes behind HIV infection. As you said, the older generations that saw this particular devastation and knew how impounding it could be on life in general. And so, you know, we look at the various infrastructures and we see that the messages that are targeted are not targeted toward this particular population. Now, so for instance, I have clients, and we were talking about this earlier, who consistently ask, once they tested positive, they know they're newly diagnosed. One of my positions are is to um, let them know that if they are taking the necessary measures and precautions, that they can live a sustainable and healthy life well into their 70s or 80s. If, you know, if we're thriving off the fact that their longevity of life is based off of HIV infection, then they could go out and get hit by a measure. I don't think we have nothing to do with that. But on the pretense that if you make these right decisions and you're in a space where you're, the person is able to have these social constructs and conversations, and I think because those are becoming um, not as prevalent as we would need them to be. Um, in lieu of the fact that most of the young people that I see, they really don't come from communities where healthcare is of the biggest thing of importance. Um, practicing safe sex, on the other hand, you know, young people easily will fall in love. Um, they will easily get engaged with someone, and six months into a relationship, they feel like this person has been honest and given them all this truth about their health and wellness, and the next thing you know, coming down the road, they can find out that they're HIV positive. And so, not only dealing with the fact that they have to discuss the nuances in their life that they go through about being a black, gay, young person, then they also have to deal with the pressure of coping with a stigmatized medical illness. And so, for them, it's easier for me to, or for them to say or not reveal or disclose their status because that's the additional stigma that relates to that. Um, thinking of ways where with this next generation there needs to be a new kind of measure of, me of, of, of messages. And I think because we see like, you know, we'll see greater than needs and we'll see different ad posts, but it's not showing same gender loving young people same gender-loving African-American young people that are able to see that it's okay to talk about sex. It's okay to talk about gay sex. Um, and so I really feel like um, a part of that intersection, if we are going to make these messages more profound, we must intersect more with those healthcare entities, government agencies, um, social marketing campaigns, all those things that are going to help increase um, the level of awareness to this 
next generation of young people? Uh, one thing I'm, I'm thinking is that, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll say this here, I'm a 44-year-old gay man, but if anybody asks you outside the room, I'm officially 39, so just remember that. Uh, but I have, I've known people over the course of my life, over the course of the past 10 years, uh, who I've known for a long time, who zero converted later in life. So obviously, there are both, but at all ends of the age spectrums, there are issues about what the barriers are. I'm kind of curious if anybody, if any of you three have some thoughts about what the specific barriers might be for people who aren't in, aren't in the youth population, but might still be finding you know, difficulty either sustaining safer sex behavior or even addition making it a part of their life. Well, um, so one of the things, like I said, I can share tonight is some, is, is some statistics to some of the, the data that we are collecting through some different studies that we're doing to give us at least some framework of what we do know, what we don't know, and, and how we bridge that um, and, and address what we need to address. So, um, a few things. One, it's actually younger people use condoms more than older people. Uh, statistics show dramatic declines in condom use among, uh, even in a short period of time between after uh, uh, people reach their 20s, it almost dec it declines by about 50% in terms of what uh, adolescents in condom use versus ones that become uh, older. Um, so some of the, 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 the and even even older as that progresses, as people get older, it still can, continues that there's less condom use. So some of the notions that because, and I guess I'll be the senior <laughs> member of the panel since, uh, I, uh, and I started working on HIV in New York City in 1985, uh, so well before we had but that uh, even that generation that thinks that, well, we know, we saw people, we experienced um, losing people, that doesn't seem to translate necessarily into common use um, consistently. So I think we have, as, as the members mentioned, even among adults, a lot of a complexity as what's going on with gay men in terms of, of what is, and I was looking at some other studies in terms of what's deliberate, what's not deliberate. I mean, we talk a lot about some of the things that are truths that, you know, that, that we need to talk more about, which we don't, which is desire. You know, we, we like to have sex. I mean, not just, not just gay men. I mean, men, people like to have sex. Um, but maybe it says really against gay men. Um, so... <laughs> So that's that's a factor. I mean, you know, one of our campaign messages is get wrapped up in the moment because people talk about they're in that moment, they really want to be with that guy, and that factor of if I if I if he won't use a condom, but I really want to have sex with him, I will not use a condom, even though my better judgment, even though I may have it, you know, it's under the bed, it's in the it's in the uh, following metro weeklies where. Uh, but even though it's there and they know how to get them and know and know what they're for, it doesn't mean that that moment that they get used. Uh, and now we have a new complexity that's being added, which I think is um, uh, part of what we need to address: is the notions of ser we talk about serious sorting. We talk about now we've added into a new dimension, which is we, we're not we're knowledgeable. We hear about these things about viral expression. We've learned about, we've heard some things about PrEP. Um, not everybody, you know, a survey done, it was about a quarter of gay men had, had heard about PrEP. But then, uh, as many as more than about 40% of them said that if they were able to use PrEP, they would reduce their condoms. Uh, so the, the notion that now we have viral load sorting, not just you know, zero sorting, but actually knowing well, okay, if your viral load is fully suppressed, then that's then that that adds a new dimension to it. So, um, and and, and I think we we need to do a better job of getting more information out there um, and providing.
invites Corey in, and they say it to, to talk more about sex. I mean, that's the part that we don't seem to talk about that much. And, uh, or advise, or, you know, give advice about what's good sex. Um, uh, some to young people, but to the rest of us as well. And these, there are some scientific findings that, it's, that seem to point to really promising and encouraging that yes, these are, these could actually, these could work. That if we suppress the virus, then it reduces significantly the chances to transmit it. So what, transmit it, HIV, so what does that mean? We, we've only heard it in the scientific settings, we don't know about it in public health practice. And that's one of the things that I, we're kind of trying to sort, sort out ourselves in the Department of Health is, how do you take what we're learning now, and we're learning so many different things, and apply that in a programmatic context? Um, so I think that would be very helpful. Um, but I don't think we can, we don't, we shouldn't abandon that condoms are still the only device that we have that, that can block this, um, this virus.